It's a really a pleasure to introduce Tino Chow. At RISD, we take great pride in our role in helping to produce innovators and provocateurs, dynamic creative thinkers who are not afraid to ask difficult questions and to challenge basic structures when needed. Our next speaker has been questioning, challenging, creating, and leading for a long time. Tino graduated from RISD with a degree in industrial design in 2009 but even before his time with us, he was learning important lessons as an officer in the Singaporean military, which you'll hear more about today. Lessons about leadership, about team building, about collaboration, and indeed, as he will share with us, creativity. Tino applied his creativity and innovation, as well as his desire to provoke and to challenge both in and out of the classroom while he was at RISD. In 2008, Tino was a junior in his department, you know, a second year from the end, who felt the need for more contact with what he called the heroes of design, and a wider sense of how exactly creative people out in the field collaborate, how they build trust, how they bring po projects to completion, and just as he and his soldiers had did, done in Singapore. And we were talking about some of these issues this morning ab about how um, new thinkers are using the things that they're learning to produce these sort of new outcomes from, from their education. So Tino, in collaboration with other students, decided to make this happen. And together they co-founded a conference called Better World by Design, which brought together really interesting thinkers from around the globe. And it was a totally student-driven conference, uh, collaboratively with students from Brown University and RISD. It was a three-day conference with an, that ran annually. And the mission of that conference is to envision a world where design thinking is accessible to everyone in order to catalyze positive change on a local and global scale. So they had a very modest mission, right? But I will say that we just hosted this couple weekends ago, the ninth incarnation of this remarkable event, which brought over 700 designers, educators, innovators, and learners from 195 different zip codes and four countries together to think and work collaboratively. And how wonderful to think that you could build something that was so sound that you don't need to run it anymore, that it's taking off on its own and continuing to grow and expand. It's really a wonderful example of leadership. Since leaving RISD, Tino has continued his work. He has become an internationally recognized designer, entrepreneur, public speaker at places like TED conferences and others, a rising star to say the least. Tino recently founded his own firm and called it Giant Shoulders and Company, and I think he'll talk about why in his talk. And in this work and elsewhere, Tino is putting his skills and talents in design, branding, leadership, and collaboration to really remarkable use, applying his conceptual expertise to all sorts of innovative projects and partnerships that you will learn more about in a minute. We are very proud of Tino's work, the legacy he is building, and excited about what he will bring to the future. So it's my great pleasure to ask everyone to please welcome Tino Chow to the stage. Thank you. Wow, that was quite an introduction. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Tino, as you know, um, and I'm here to talk about sort of future of um, what I believe will be built on creativity and collaboration. So, that's the title of the talk. So some of the lessons that have been most influential in my creative career, I first learned in the military. I was born in Singapore, where I'm Military service is mandatory for all young men. But I grew up in Hong Kong. So what that meant was that when I turned 18, all my friends were getting on a plane or you know, getting ready to go to university and college. I was dreading joining the military. So I didn't have high expectations. And I knew that I just had to get through the two and a half years. Then I can go to, go to art school where I thought my creative education would start. So what I didn't expect was how my military expectation, or my military experience 
would shape me as a designer and influence the way that I see the future of the creative industry. In the military, I learned about collaboration. And since then, I've been learning how to relate to it as a creative. So the world is changing, as you might know. Um, while technologies and tools are increasingly equipping individuals to do more and more creative work and sidestepping creatives, um, at the same time, businesses are seeing greater value in incorporating creativity into their organizations, into culture and their processes. So what I'm talking about is pretty simple, is that we are experience, experiencing a shift in the value of creativity and our roles as creatives. Well, this, this has actually happened before, and history has a way of repeating itself. From the Industrial Revolution to the Arts and Craft Movement to post-war technologies that free women to join the workforce to spreadsheets that completely change the accounting world. As you can see, technology is a double-edged sword. It made complex processes faster and commoditized them to become cheaper. Artists no longer need record labels. Authors no longer need publishers. And companies and organizations are sidestepping web designers and developers to build their own websites. And 3D printing has already changed the way that we prototype ideas and is challenging us in how we look at manufacturing. These tools are shifting the value of creativity and asking us to redefine who we are as creatives. While the world is reaching out to us and trying to make a connection to how to incorporate creativity in, into what they do, as we have heard last night from Otto and the panel today, we have an obligation and a responsibility of reaching back out to them. We are living in an increasingly connected world where we have to take into account the different perspectives, cultures, and languages, and that's only touching upon the tip of the iceberg. Leaders and companies and governments are realizing that the only way to tackle this complexity is by thinking differently. And to do that, it requires creativity and collaboration. Creativity and collaboration is the approach that I've seen over and over again in resilient organizations and in leaders who seem to continue to thrive even in adversity. So make no mistake, collaboration is difficult and sometimes frustrating, and probably most of the time frustrating. But when it's done well, the multiplying effect far outweighs individual accomplishments. So I finally got to go to art school um, and went to RISD, uh, but I wasn't what you call a model student. Um, I was always interested in things outside a classroom, and I remember that there was a time when a reporter uh, was interviewing me because I so happened to wake up at 5.30 in the morning to go running with then President John Maida. So the reporter asked me what I thought of my RISD education. And uh, without actually thinking through my answer, I said something to the effect, well, I didn't learn much in the classroom. So I could see the reporter's, well, the blood from the reporter's face draining kept out and was just kept giving this dead pan. And I turned to my right and John Maida was there grinning. And I knew that he caught on with what I was actually trying to say rather than what I actually said. Um, so my experience in the classroom was more often about my individual advancement. Um, I, I was either learning a skill or solving a problem by myself. Uh, and it was outside the walls of the classroom where I got to meet other students, other faculty from different disciplines. And I got really interested in what they, how they thought about the problems and how they went about doing things. So one of these times I came across a couple of students from the engineering department at Brown University who are interested in social and environmental impact. And that piqued my interest because at the time, as Roseanne mentioned, I was you know, trying to figure out kind of how to relate to the world as a designer and really was um, kind of asking these questions. 
So although we came from very different backgrounds, we had this in common. And we wanted to figure out how to work together to create positive change. So in fact, there were actually hundreds of us across both Brown and RISD's campus who were asking the same question. From engineers to illustrators, doctors, to graphic designers, chemists, artists, computer scientists alike. Well, we first approached the universities at the time, but neither Brown nor RISD were really ready to um, feed our curiosity. Even though there were interests, it would have taken years before formal classes could be offered. So the opportunity for us was then, and what we decided to do is simply to sidestep the system and the establishment and decided that we should take learning into our own hands. So I joined up with the students at, that met at Brown, and along with students at RISD, we started the conference Better World by Design. So through it, we were able to invite our heroes to do the great work that they're doing in the field, to share with us their experience so that we can learn from them firsthand. So although we were aligned in the overarching goal, we had to figure out how to work together. So the first thing that we did, <laughs> the first thing that we did was to write a business plan. Um, and as a designer, as a creative, that wasn't my idea, but was probably the most important thing that we could have ever done. We mapped out the roles that we would play, the roles that needed to be filled, and the resources that we needed to make this happen. We knew that we could not do this alone. And with that, we went out and found bigger partners who are willing to collaborate with us to get this off the ground and get to our goal. And with that, we built a collaboration between the two schools and also with the city of Providence. So we brought together around about 300 people from around the country the first year, and for the next eight years, um, grew to around about 1,000 um, people each year. So once again, as Roseanne can mention, is that the most amazing thing that uh, remains um, is that this is a student-run conference. Um, I have actually got nothing to do with it for the last five years, which is great, because I can take credit for what someone else have done. Um, and each year, the student leadership picks the next group of students to carry on the vision. So the goals and the roles that we defined in that business plan became the template for the sustainable collaborative culture. So and then it was 2009. Um, that was the year that I joined the workforce as a designer. It was two years after the first iPhone came out and smartphones were just getting popular. Um, UI UX or user interface and user experience was not yet a term. Um, it was a brand new practice. Design thinking was just entering the mainstream and it's starting to, starting to gain momentum. And on top of all that, we were in the middle of one of the worst recessions in history, where design was seen as a luxury. And yet, in the midst of all of this, there was a forward-thinking healthcare company who was looking for creatives, a lot of creatives. So Mayo Clinic at the time just started the Center for Innovation a department made up of designers, artists, researchers, and other collaborators with one single goal in mind, to go look for problems in healthcare and to come up with solutions. And I was brought in as, a, as an outside creative consultant to join the team who was looking at designing solutions for an unhealthy town. So the data clearly states that there is a problem, um, and we were looking to design effective solutions. And what Mayo Clinic learned is that they needed to engage with community and to collaborate with them to create a sustainable solution. So I just saw a side step and talk about the healthcare industry really quickly, is that the traditional healthcare model is based on performance and prolonging life at all costs, or any cost. Um, but what this neglects is the humanity of patients and the people that they pledge to serve. So similar to the creative industry, the healthcare industry is facing challenges stemming from new technologies, practices, and public or changing public perceptions. They understood that they needed to integrate different perspectives, and specifically perspectives from people who are trained 
to engage with empathy. And that is the reason why creatives like myself were invited into the process and in some ways um, and sometimes to provide leadership. We were given the autonomy to explore and to ask questions that may seem too obvious or even irrelevant to entrenched professionals. So let me tell you a story of a, um, of a student who I met there who also went to RISD. Her name is Samantha Dempsey. She's an illustrator who had a very different experience from me in how she related to collaboration in the healthcare world, and specifically as an artist. She was part of a STEM to STEAM fellowship that exposed organizations to creatives, where she was given the space to explore and to find out how she could apply herself in that organization. Samantha saw herself as a, so a visual storyteller, and towards the end of a fellowship there, she developed a documentation kit that highlighted what she had learned through the lens of an illustrator in the healthcare world. So, just imagine for a second um, that you got into an accident and you're, you're being taken to the hospital for a checkup. So at the scene, you were asked, asked what happened, and so you tell your story. And then the medical team arrived, and they asked you again what happened, so you tell that story again. And um, when you're at the hospital while you're checking in, you're asked to tell that story again, and so you repeat that story again. And then again to the nurses, and then to the doctors. So by the time you get to the doctor, you have pretty much formulated um, your story based on what you think they want to hear. So that is only human. I mean, our stories or even jokes evolve over time based on how people react to it. And that can be a problem when patients are trained only to share what they think is important and omit um, details that may be critical. So what Samantha asks patients to do is pretty simple and it's to draw their experiences with the help of a few cues. And this made them very uncomfortable, not because that they are not artists, but it forced them to move away from the rehearsed answers and to re-engage with their experiences. So by doing so, they make con new connections with their own experience. Um, and the process, actually, we found out later that is therapeutic for some. And this set of tools that she designed in 2010 as an intern is still used in Mayo Clinic today. So this is when it clicked for me that creativity and co collaboration together are the key to building a better future. Well, this all sounds great. So let's shift gears a little bit and let's talk about what may be the biggest obstacle to collaboration which is the fear of losing your identity. True collaboration only, what I believe is that true collaboration only strengthens individual identity. Collaboration is at its best when there's a diversity of thinking and skill and the openness to different perspectives. When people think alike, it end up ignoring alternative viewpoints and therefore not arriving to the optimal solution. True collaboration is about finding balance between individual ideas and, collective, and the collective goal. So collaboration is worth doing, but like any craft, it takes practice. So to better understand how creativity and collaboration works in an organization like Mayo Clinic, we have to first look at what makes a collaborative environment. And the best place to look is the military. So I believe that the military is one of the most collaborative environments there is. And what you need is two things to create that environment. It's a collective goal and clearly defined roles. So in the military, the goal is assigned, so we don't actually spend a whole lot of time debating it or discussing it. You just have to agree with it one way or the other. Um, so secondly, with the defined roles, like any sports team, everybody on the field knows exactly why they are there and what they are expected to do. So in the military, we are all trained in different specialties, um, and we clearly know 
why we are there, and the role that we play. So the opposite example is politics, where everyone seems to have their own agenda, and everybody seems to be taking credit for someone else's job. So the military hierarchy may be stifling, but like any organization, it's about the people. And I'm very grateful to have come under the command of some of the best leaders I know, where I learned, where I learned and experienced from them firsthand how they created space for collaboration. So one of the most important lessons I've learned is that management is built on mistrust or distrust, whereas leadership is built on trust. Management is built on distrust, whereas leadership is built on trust. Collaboration is hard and sometimes frustrating. It feels like you're, you might be taking steps sideways or even backwards. But we collaborate not because it is easier, but because it is better. So we worked hard to build the collaborative culture at Better World by Design. We spent a lot of time crafting the vision and defining the various roles. But at the end of the day, like the lesson that I've learned in the military, it is about the people we get to work alongside. It is knowing where I end and where we, and where we begin. And that is a very hard thing to do. We needed to learn how to trust one another, which gives us a safe space to speak our mind and the confidence to explore beyond known boundaries. But to do all of this, we have to start with ourselves. Trust requires us to let go. It requires us to acknowledge that we cannot see everything or know everything. Trust, trust is acknowledging that we have blind spots and also sometimes acknowledging that there are other people that are better than us. So let's just uh, do a quick recap. Um, so to create a collaborative environment, you need a collective goal and clearly defined role, or clearly defined roles. To collaborate effectively, we need to build trust with your collaborators. And what trust requires us to do is to be honest with ourselves and to be vulnerable. So a quick show of hands here. Um, who, have, who here have been to art school or been, to, been at a critique? Great, that's basically everybody, so thank you and good night. <laughs> um, so, uh, well, what the, the story I'm gonna share with you next, I, I guess, would be very relevant um, in terms of kind of how we as creatives are trained to be vulnerable. So I was speaking with Roseanne Summerson a few months ago in preparation for this talk, and I was reminded of how crits was such an essential part of my education. I was taught how to be vulnerable by communicating my ideas to my peers and receiving feedback for my work. And the latter was by far the harder thing to do. It took us a while to get used to what seemed like open heart surgery. And towards the end, I either grew, or we either grew really thick skin or just simply got used to challenging one another. And that became the new norm. So when I was working at a branding and marketing agency down in New York, um, I took over leading the creative team after a merger with a larger company. And that was a very difficult time because we were trying to realign ourselves to the new mission of the company, along with new processes and culture. So statistically, most merger and acquisitions end with high talent turnover, because what often makes business sense may not often make people sense. Up until that point, the creative team didn't have a habit of working together. And on top of that, we had to learn how to work with a new team with different expectations. We needed a different mindset if we were going to collaborate successfully. So I thought I, I would uh, convert my art school experience into the workplace and throw my team into a weekly crit. So that all sounds great, <laughs> but what I haven't mentioned is that the people who I'm working with are some of the most talented creatives I've known, but they are mostly self-taught. So um, what I've effectively done is throw them into the deep end 
and without actually teaching them to swim. So the first few crits were pretty uncomfortable. So the idea was completely foreign to them, um, and I could see fear in their eyes. The fear of getting it wrong, the fear of getting reprimanded by a superior, the fear of judgment, and the fear of not being good enough. So over the next couple of weeks, we developed some ground rules for our weekly crit. Firstly, you leave project scope and timeline at the door. Secondly, is that this is a space where we're helping each other with our craft and what it meant to us individually to be a designer. And finally, and probably the most important, um, most important rule, is that there can be no finished work. You can only talk about work in progress. So it, took us, it still took us weeks beyond that to get used to the idea of being vulnerable. We started to share what we did. We started to talk about how we did the work that we did. And most importantly, the, why we made the decisions that we made. We didn't just become a better team. We became better individuals. We got to know one another and learn about how to work with one another and trust each other. So I learned a great deal from everyone. Um, and also kind of learn a lot about each individual. So when I recently started my, started my new company, it was a no-brainer for me to bring them along as part of my team. So this is my new venture. Um, so my new venture is built on top of the principles I just talked about, which is creativity and collaboration. And that's kind of very much what I hold dear um, individually, and I wanted every part of the company to reflect that. So we are a collective of artists, designers, entrepreneurs, engineers, architects, researchers, software engineers, analysts, project managers, coming from very different backgrounds. We're not as self-taught or in traditional ways or in big companies or small companies, coming together to share our knowledge and skills and build upon each other's work. We believe that there are those who talk about building a better future. But we belong to the few who dare to make it happen. And our goal is to create the space to collaborate and to also lead collaboration. This, perhaps, is the hardest thing I've ever undertaken. Collaboration is difficult. And building that environment from the ground up made me realize I needed to relearn some of the lessons that I've just shared with you today. But I know what to expect on the other side. And I'm very much looking forward to it. We are on this journey together. And we have the opportunity to challenge one another and to collaborate with those who don't see the world the same way we do. Our world is changing all around us. And how we react to it will define us. We have to decide for ourselves whether not to act out of fear or, or to be honest with ourselves and to be vulnerable with each other. We have to decide for ourselves if we're going to head into the future alone or to multiply our effects, uh, multiply our efforts by collaborating with each other. It is going to take practice. And even if you are a seasoned collaborator, this will push you beyond your, your comfort zone. But I believe that, is a, that it is worth it. So I'll leave you guys with a question. And it's a very tangible place to start. Who is one person that you would want to collaborate with and why? Thank you.